Today I want to tackle the most common questions I've gotten in the comment section regarding this series. It's been a lot of fun. There are a couple rules I've set up for myself. Uh, number one, I try to consolidate as many questions as I can to keep the video short. Keeping in mind that this is a beginner series, so there are a few questions that were much more advanced and a couple of them I will refer to and then to give you some sources where you can find out more. Again, to keep the video short and focused on beginners. I thought I'd start with the generator questions. Let's get it rolling. Someone asked, can you do a video on self-excited generators? Uh, I am thinking about doing more videos on generators later, but basically a self-excited generator is a generator that uses some of its output current to supply the stator and create the electromagnetic stator field. Now, that is not free energy, but it's more complex than I want to explain in this video. But there is another video that talks about the difference between self-excited generators and separately excited. And what I'll do is post a link in the description where you can watch more on that because that video is really good. Related to that is, can you use universal motors as generators and can you use induction motors as generators? Now, in the generator video, I did talk about universal motors not being a good option for generators because you need more complex circuitry. You've got to supply the stator field with electricity in order to produce a magnetic field. Well, if you use a permanent magnet motor, all you have to do is spin the shaft. And so that was the context that I was talking about in that video. It's very common for a DIYer to come along and say, hey, Jeremy, how do I make a generator at home? For those people, I recommend you use a permanent magnet DC motor because they are so much simpler. A few of you commented and say, hey, don't call alternators work like that where you supply current to the stator and so on and so on. And the answer is, of course, in fact, the larger the scale, the more important it is that you use an electromagnet. So all industrial DC generators use electromagnets in the stator field. And so that means you're going to have to have current flowing to the stator field in order to have an industrial size DC generator. So hopefully that clears that up. I wasn't saying that a universal motor cannot be used as a generator. In fact, I think I made that very clear in the video. It's just that for home use, I don't recommend you use uh, a universal motor. Related to that, can induction motors be used as generators? And the answer is, well, yes and no. Uh, again, this is similar to before. For DIY applications, I'm going to say you can't do it without significantly modifying the motor or you need a lot of external power. Now, large companies sometimes use their induction motors to push current back into the grid and they make money that way or they save on their power bill, one of the two. So if you've got large uh, diesel powered motors and you want to spin your induction motor over speed, you've got to spin it over sync speed, then in those cases you can use some type of external mechanical means to spin your induction motor over speed and it's still got to have power to it and in those cases they can push power back into the grid and so it is in, in effect a generator. In fact I um, took some pictures of some induction motors from work and so here you'll see a picture of I think a 1500 horsepower motor and these motors are potential candidates where if you had some mechanical means of spinning the shaft above the synchronous speed you could push power back into the grid and, uh, and it would in effect be a generator. Sort of a semi question that came up from a couple people is they asked, they requested that I draw schematics when I discussed the motor wiring. And I was actually intentional about not drawing many schematics in the series, although I did do it a couple of times because I didn't want to have to explain what all the symbols mean and create another video is things you need to know because it can be confusing. You watch one video that's using conventional current flow, meaning that elect that current is flowing from positive to negative, and then you watch another video that emphasizes the electrons moving, so current flows from negative to positive. The schematics can be confusing when somebody's pointing at one thing and telling you current is flowing in one direction and you're expecting it to be the other way. So I just decided to try to avoid that topic and uh, not make a video about schematics and current flow and voltage and amps and I tried to avoid those kind of topics which I think move away from what the series is about which is specifically about how motors work so I tried to focus more on the 
hands-on. There's very little theory presented in this series. It's all about what is actually happening that can be measured and touched. And that was the focus of this series. Now looking back on it, I do think that there were a couple other places where a schematic would have been more helpful and I probably should have added it, but that was my initial reasoning for sort of dodging the schematics on, uh, on many of the videos. He said, you know what has always confused me about electricity is ground. And I had the same feeling when I first started teaching myself this stuff. Uh, ground is kind of confusing until you realize that it doesn't actually do anything. It's more of a safety feature. So I'm going to post a video which is really helpful from Rimstar.org where he talks about ground and how it works. There's a link in the description that will really open your eyes to what ground does and why it's always wired to the body of the motor in this case or if it's a microwave or something like that, it'll be to the metal shell. You'll find that video very interesting and helpful, I think. So a couple people asked about uh, the capacitor. They had questions about capacitors. Some of those actually came before I did the single phase motor video. And so if you still have questions about capacitors, then I'm gonna encourage you to hit up Google and do some searching because I think talking about capacitors more than what I did in the video is kind of going beyond the scope of uh, this series. I think all of us know by now there's a huge, vast source of information online, and sometimes it's hard to find what you're looking for, but it is available. One of my favorite questions came from Daniel where he says, hey, you know, great video. How do you know all this stuff? And the short answer is, I taught myself. Uh, I searched online, I purchased some books, uh, there's some motor websites that I went to, people who produce motors, have good technical documents on how their motors work, and I learned through researching and tinkering in the shop. And that to me is the best way to do it. So there you go, I learned this stuff from tinkering in the shop, reading books, and seeking information online. Alright, talking about sources, I've got several sources that I used during this series. Again, they are all linked in the description, but there are a few that I want to show uh, in the video. Number one, is this book called DC Theory. And my wife actually brought me this book from the library. It was in the free section, the, the books that they were giving away. She brought it home and she said, this looks like something you would read, do you want it? And I was like, yeah. So I read the whole thing in one weekend and DC Theory sounds more complicated than it is. It's not that bad. It was really helpful to help uh, iron out some of the details about how the DC motor works and uh, current flow, things like that. So this is a good one. After reading that one, I went and bought the AC version and I bought this on Amazon, I think. I will put a link to this in the description so that you can check it out. But this is the AC Theory one. I didn't read all of it actually, I just primarily focused on the last few chapters about AC motors and AC generators. Two more books that were helpful uh, is this, this book on three phase motors. and a companion book on single phase motors. So a friend of mine gave me these books, so these are borrowed, I don't own these books, and I've been uh, reading and referencing those books throughout the series just to make sure I'm presenting things correctly and clearly. Those books were helpful as well. There's a link in the description, please have a look, where you can get those on Amazon or you might be able to find them you know, on eBay used or something like that, so have a look there. Okay, there are quite a few questions about three-phase motors. In particular, people want to know how to run a three-phase motor on single-phase power. Uh, the short answer is you should purchase a VFD. That's what I think you should do. They sell variable frequency drives that convert the single-phase to three-phase and will drive your motor. And most of them, if not all of them, also have variable speed so that you can actually control the speed of a three-phase motor. So that to me is the ideal solution. Now, for you really die hard people who don't want to spend that money and you want to go the absolute cheap option, there is a way that you can wire a three phase motor with capacitors in order to shift the phase on the third line a little bit and get that motor to run. But there's some risk involved with this and so I want to make a whole separate video where I address this issue. A couple of you asked about the laminated iron plates. Why is it cut up in thin sheets instead of it being one solid piece? And that's more of a technical question, but I will address it uh, briefly and then encourage you to read some other resources that are in the description. If you made it all one solid block, iron, you can induce current flow in iron the same way you do in the rotor. And so in this case, you've got a spinning magnetic field. 
that can induce current flow in the rotor. But if it was one solid core, the iron core, it would also induce current flow in the iron core. And those would be what's called eddy currents. They just kind of swirl around in the iron and they're not doing anything. All of the power coming into the motor must be accounted for. If you are inducing current flow in the rotor and in the iron core, then that power is being wasted. All the power that's going into the iron core, that is. And that, that current is just swirling around. It's not producing any mechanical work. The way engineers prevent this is they slice it up into thin sheets. That makes it more difficult for current to flow in the iron core and you don't draw that power from the wall. All the power being drawn in is being saturated into the rotor and in the end it just makes for a more efficient motor that uses less energy. I've gotten a lot of great compliments throughout this video series about the quality of the series, the, the detail and the information, the examples that were given and in this video I really want to push that attention towards the patrons because it was really them who funded this whole series and allowed me to make many of the examples that I did. I'm so grateful for their help. I sure hope that you guys will let them know how much you appreciate it as well. So I'm going to show their names here at the end of the video. And if you would, in the comment section, tell one of them thank you instead of me. If you're not a subscriber and you'd like to be notified when new videos come out, hit the little subscribe button there and YouTube will let you know the next time I post. This has been a lot of fun. I'll probably be adding more videos to this series later on in the future, but until then, thanks for watching.